Thank you all very much for coming. Good afternoon. As Amy said, my name is Hilde Kraus, and I'm here to introduce someone very close to my heart, my father, Steve Kraus. He is a survivor, to be sure, and he's also someone with an enormous zest for life, a distinct avidity for new experiences, and an adventurer. He's done many different kinds of work, chief among them journalism, stock market analysis, and interpreting. Dad has traveled wildly, widely and wildly, <laughs> and he has a knack of connecting with people wherever he goes. He currently publishes a nifty newsletter called New York Good News, which is actually about good news from all over the place. It was featured recently in the Huffington Post. Clearly, his optimism is undimmed. A little known fact about him, a couple of years ago, he was spotted by a talent scout on his stoop in Manhattan and ended up in a fashion shoot for W Magazine. <laughs> I mentioned that my father is an adventurer. Today, he is going to discuss what was perhaps his first great adventure, fleeing the German invasion with his family in September 1939, with some background on pre-war Poland as well. Please give a warm welcome to Steve Krauss. Salami, salami. Uh, <clears throat> I think I'd like to begin by, the, and I hope the organizers don't mind, correcting a couple of things. First of all, I'm now 82. I was nine years old when the war broke out. And it also says in this flyer, there's a, after an arduous journey. The journey was really not arduous at all. And thirdly, I'd like to say that I did wind up in 1941 in a place which was called Palestine then. As you probably know, most of it today is called Israel, but at that time it was a British administered mandate. The, the Brits got the mandate from the League of Nations, so Israel came into being in 1948. Anyway, <clears throat> just wanted to clear that up. I was born in, on December 4th, 1929, into a rather well-to-do family in Poland. My grandfather uh, <coughs> became, I would think, one of the richest Jews in Poland. Uh, after World War I, he was joined in his firm by his son, and uh, uh, although they started by selling Singer, so my grandfather got the agency for Poland of the Singer sewing machine, which at that time was, you know, was a revelation, because most clothes, uh, I think, were made by tailors, and uh, my parents were also rather extraordinary people. Uh, my father fought in World War One in the Austro-Hungarian army. My, uh, his father was a doctor. My mother was one of the first women lawyers in Poland. They were also, both of them, pioneers of skiing in Poland, and they met on the slopes. That's how they, they met. So my life in pre-war Poland was very comfortable. I still don't know and I only have one aunt left, and I may find out from her how it is that my family was so well-to-do in the 30s with the world gripped by a terrible depression. And we were very well-to-do. Uh, my father became the vice president of a large insurance company. My parents separated sometime in the mid-30s. But when war broke out, my mother told me much later on, he came and said, my place is with you. So we rode into exile very comfortably in the limousine, I think it was a Packard, the limousine which my father's company had, you know, given to him, and with our chauffeur. <laughs> I remember the outbreak of the war. I was nine years old. We, we lived in a rather comfortable apartment. I was all alone, and I don't remember it was my governess or a maid. 
my parents had probably gone out to see if they could get anything from the banks, which of course they couldn't. The war broke out and the banks closed their doors. So I was all alone and I, all I remember is looking out of a window on a plane high up. I didn't hear any bombing and I don't, I don't know, might have been a Polish plane, it was probably a German plane. As you might know, of course, Warsaw later on was heavily bombed and besieged by the Germans, held out for quite a while. We left at night and I remember the streets full of people leaving the city. And I remember a long line of nuns walking. We rode away in this car and I think already the car was pretty full because people didn't have a car but they had gasoline. So they traded places in the car for gasoline. So I think possibly, although this was a large comfortable car, there may have been eight adults and two children. One of the things I remember is some place in our flight to the east, we stopped in some town and I was in my pajamas I think and I bounded out of the car because it was morning and there was a newspaper kiosk and I went there and I asked whether my favorite comic book for, because it was, let's say it was Tuesday and on Tuesday, I would buy this comic book. And the lady that ran the kiosk sadly said, it didn't come from Warsaw this time. Anyway, we uh, wound up for a while, the, okay, there was a rather dramatic time at the crossroads and I guess the adults was or, you know, there was a crucial moment, should we keep going east into the Soviet Union or south to Romania? And uh, I, I, I remember it. It was a crossroads, just countryside, crossroads, and I guess a discussion among the adults. And uh, the chauffeur, who I think was a socialist, said, no, no, let's go into <laughs> the Soviet Union, I'll work. Uh, doctor, my father had a doctor degree, so uh, Dr. Kraus will work, it'll be all right. And my mother said, no, no, let's go south into Romania, which was a very wise thing to say and do because uh, the Soviets did not look fondly on professionals, on people with soft hands. My father might have wound up among the 10,000 Polish officers and professionals executed on Stalin's orders at Katyn a year later. So on the way to Romania we stopped at a rather nice estate of some friends, friend of my father's I think, and uh, I remember a light plane landing and a young officer emerged and later on my mother told me that he had whispered to the general who was there also the, the, the Soviets had crossed the border. It was September 17th, as you know probably, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia signed a pact by which, uh, a few days before the beginning of the war. So he whispered to the general, the, in French, you know, to keep it a secret, mm -hmm. the Soviets had crossed the border. We went south from there and I remember crossing the border and this must have been maybe September 20th or 22nd. Warsaw fought on and the, the road leading into Romania was full of cars and planes which should have been fighting to defend Warsaw were flying into Romania. And we wound up in a little town called Gura Homorului. This was in Romania already. And the rather dramatic memory I have, we were staying, I guess, in a pension or a small hotel. It was afternoon. My parents were inside and I wandered out to the porch. And a car came by 
and two soldiers got out of it carrying a brand new, never used anti-tank rifle to which the Poles had produced and sold abroad so that the colonels, the semi-fascist colonels who ran Poland could buy their shoes in England and their ties in Paris. And these two soldiers got out and the, the stock of the rifle was this color. It was, had never been used. And just then, and I'm not making this up, somebody turned on the radio and a voice came out in Polish. This is Radio Warsaw. Warsaw fights on. And here was this rifle in Romania. I don't think we stayed, by the way, Gura Ploeshti was in Transylvania. <laughs> and you know, maybe I'm making this up, but there, there was something weird about it. <laughs> anyway, we went to a rather large town north of Bucharest called Ploeshti with large and very important oil fields. And we stayed in a villa. I mean, it wasn't our villa, but I guess my parents rented a room or a floor. As I said, our escape was really not arduous. And I do remember one night going up on the roof with my parents and the entire horizon was aflame. British saboteurs had set fire to the oil fields because the government of Romania was already flirting with Nazi Germany. We stayed for a while in Ploeshti, then we went to Bucharest. And although I didn't see it, I heard that the soldiers in the Romanian army were barefoot by the Royal Guard because we stayed not far from the Royal Palace. The Royal Guard was gorgeously attired, like from a 1930s Ziegfeld operetta. <laughs> you know, very colorful uniforms. And um, we stayed in Bucharest for a while and then, uh, as I like to call it, the ground started getting warm. The government of Romania started getting closer to Hitler. So we left for Yugoslavia. Now Yugoslavia was important to us because one of my aunts had married a Yugoslav and he was a part, he, he was, he worked for my grandfather's firm and he was the honorary Yugoslav consul in Warsaw and he had some family in a tiny place was in Croatia no sorry Slovenia outside of Ljubljana called Doleni Lokatec so we stayed there for a while and then we went anyway by this time it was spring we went to a couple of places in Yugoslavia and we spent the summer of 1940 with Europe ablaze with Hitler invading Denmark, Norway, Holland, Belgium, and then the battle for France. And we lay on the golden sands of the Dalmatian sea coast. So now you know I objected to the, to the word arduous journey. So we were there for a while. Then we went back to Zagreb, which I think is the, today the capital of an independent. But at that time, Yugoslavia consisted of Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia. It, it was sort of a federation. I think for a while we were in Belgrade, and it was in Belgrade that I renewed my acquaintance with American media. American media were already sweeping the planet well before World War II. First, not only the cinema, but comics. <coughs> and already in Poland, I was reading comic books, which uh, actually they weren't comic books, they were little, they called little big books. There would be one page of text and a photo, and there would be Tarzan, uh, Flash Gordon, Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounties, I think. And once we got to Yugoslavia, the main newspaper which came out of Belgrade was called, and I believe it's still, a, you know, it's still coming out, it's called Politica. And every Thursday they had a comic supplement. And what were the comics? Cats and Yama Kids, Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, <coughs> and, and not Dick Tracy, I think. But anyway, The Phantom, 
Mandrake the magician. I think most of you are too young to remember them. Well, I can see some faces in the audience who are close to me in age, so I think they remember those comics. Now, I think you probably know that children pick up the language very quickly. And in Belgrade and Politica was in Serbian and in Cyrillic, the alphabet of Russia, Bulgaria, and Serbia. And yet I picked it up and I read the comics. My father, again, this is something that I learned much later. We were living in Belgrade, I guess in a not particularly luxurious pension. And my mother tells me that New Year's Eve from 1940 to 1941, <laughs> father came in near midnight and spread a whole bunch of banknotes on the table. I was asleep on a cot. And mother tell, told me that she said to him, you stole, didn't you, for the child? And he said, no, I have a new job, but I cannot tell you anything about it. What it was, he was recruited by Allied Intelligence. In the Balkans, the Allied intelligence was run by the British Secret Service. Is it MI5 or M15? And I have to tell you that one of my father's, well, my father was quite a pre-war playboy. He was not, a, well, you know, I told you he was separated from my mother. And one of his, he was quite handsome, elegant, and one of his first assignments as an intelligence operative was to seduce the wife of the president of the National Bank of Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia was still neutral at the time and they had a branch in Berlin. So if you turn the wife, she could influence the husband, the president of the bank, when it, let's say you know, they would be talking about, he would, the husband <clears throat> would say, you know, I really don't know who to, I have to replace one of our people in the Berlin office. I really don't know who to send. And the wife who had been turned could suggest someone who was in the Allied intelligence apparatus. I think it was April that the prince, the king was a young man. He, well, he was a teenager. The country was run by Prince Regent Paul, and he saw which way the wind was blowing, and he went to Berlin to sign a pact with Hitler. The young officers, principally of the Yugoslav Air Force, who were pro-French and pro-British, staged a coup d'etat, and uh, when Hitler, uh, you know, and deposed the prince, re the pro-Nazi Prince Regent. When Hitler heard of this, he flew into one of his rages, I mean, tremendous rage, and he was already preparing Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, which of course was a tremendous operation of hundreds of divisions and mountains of equipment, all moving east. He was already allied, Romania had already allied with him. He had half of Poland. And he flew into a rage, and I believe he pounded the table. Goering, his Air Force chief, was there. He turned to Goering and he screamed, I want Belgrade destroyed. I want Yugoslavia. How dare they do this to me? I want, I want Yugoslavia attacked immediately. He screamed at Goering, I want Belgrade destroyed to the ground. And these generals, the Oberkommando of Wehrmacht, all there, remonstrated with him. But, you know, all the divisions were already ready, getting ready to strike east to attack the Soviet Union. And he said, I don't care, because how dare the Yugoslavs defy me, destroy Belgrade. We were already evacuated in a po the small convoy of Poles to Turkey. Father was still there 
and he left Belgrade on the last train to Saloniki in Greece before the Panzer divisions striking from the north, from the east, from Bulgaria cut the Belgrade railroad line. So he was evacuated in a convoy from Greece to Egypt, bombed, the convoy was bombed, and we were in Turkey, and I wish we went to Istanbul by train. I don't remember that much of Istanbul. I think mother and I walked around. I have a vague memory of the, what is it, the Santa Sofia, the famous cathedral, but not much. And then, this is 1941, we went by the Trans-Anatolian Express to a harbor, a port city called Mersina in southeast Turkey. I think now it's kind of an important port, but it was kind of a small, it wasn't that big at the time, and we waited there. At this point, I don't know how many of you believe in God, I happen to believe in God, and I think God has watched over our family. And I have to go back, way back, to World War I. And my father, who I told you, was a young officer in the Austro-Hungarian Royal and Imperial Army, fighting on the Italian front. And he told me that he was asleep on a, on a hillside. And during the night he had the urge to urinate, and he didn't want to do it near where he was sleeping. And, you know, he was sleeping when using a nap, his knapsack as a pillow. So he went down the hillside, and as he's doing his business, he hears a shell come over. And he, when he got back to the knapsack, completely destroyed, the shell had hit the knapsack. So if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. Anyway, I, I don't know, what, I, just, I just had a feeling, we, we were so lucky, we were so lucky. Mother and I arrived, okay, so from Mersina we took a little Polish ship called Warsaw, Warsaw, Warsaw to Haifa in Palestine. In the harbor was the wreck of a ship ironically called Patria, which was the name of the insurance company my father was with. Patria had been a small ship, possibly even a small coastal freighter, which had several hundred Jews had chartered to escape from Nazi-dominated Europe. At that time, the British still, contrary to the League of Nations mandate, allowed only 1,500 Jews to enter Palestine throughout the whole war. These people who were hoping to be allowed to land in the land of their ancestors, they were not allowed to land. They blew themselves up. They blew themselves up in the harbor. In Haifa, we didn't stay too long. We went to Tel Aviv. And I think it was there that I was interviewed by the school, the headmaster of the school that I was going to go to in Jerusalem. And I may have had some tutoring in English. Not, I don't think so, maybe a little bit. But as I said, kids, and I was 11 at the time, this is 1941, learn languages very quickly. So I wound up. <laughs> in the boarding school. My mother had a nice apartment, I mean nothing luxurious, but quite comfy, in Jerusalem. And for one year, I starved and was beaten, <laughs> for my own good, of course, in St. George's School, Jerusalem. St. George's School was what the English call it public school, which meant private school. It was attached to the St. George's Cathedral next door. And, as I said, they starved us and they beat us so that we, when we graduated, we would run the empire. 
all the students were called prefects and they had the right to come up to us if we were doing something wrong and hit us in the face. The masters, the teachers were called masters and of course the principal was called the headmaster. I once had the honor of being caned by him personally <laughs> because I only studied the courses that I was interested in. I did well in English, geography and history. Sciences I was abysmally bad at and uh, the school had a practice of a notice board on which they posted or it posted the student rankings at the end of each semester which was I think called a term and I wound swapped up at the very bottom of the form and for that I was summoned by the headmaster himself and he told me, Kraus, you have no right to be at the bottom of the firm. And he soundly caned me. And some of the canings were quite severe. They, you know, we were told to drop trow. And uh, I think sometimes the caning would draw blood. I think the next term I was number two in the class. <laughs> I, I, I got with it. We played what? We called football, which is called soccer in this country, cricket. And at that, okay, so the years advanced, I was, you know, I was 42, 43, 44, and the war was going on. The school did not particularly imbue us with any flag waving <coughs> Brit patriotism. But I guess we just felt for Britain. After all, Britain under Churchill's readership did fight alone against Hitler until 1941. And I felt badly, and maybe other students did too, because the war was being taken over to some extent by the overwhelming number of U.S. troops and U.S. ships and U.S. planes. So until 42, 43, Britain was the number one power fighting Nazis, but then it became almost a junior partner to the U.S. I was in that school till 1947. Some of my family had already come to the U.S., including my uncle. Uh, grandfather had a son and four daughters. Again, I'd like to go back a little bit. On both sides of the family, my grandparents, the father of my mother and the father of my, and the father of my uh, mother, and well, I should say the two sets of grandparents belong to the first generation of Polish Jews who wanted to be Poles. They would not give up their religion, but Yiddish was not spoken, Polish was spoken, and even more significantly, my grandfather, my mother's father, changed his Jewish name of Tobias to Theophil, and his son, his only son, was called Władysław, a very Slavic name. My mother, and then named Halina, which is, I think, of Greek origin, but then another daughter was called Bronislava, again, a Slavic name. Eva and Janina were not Slavic, but my father was called by his father, Nieczesław, again, a Slavic name. So, as I said, Walter, he called himself Walter, because Władysław was probably too difficult for Americans to say, just as my father called himself not Mieczysław, which was his first name, but Victor, which is my middle name. Walter was already here, and he had established himself in the old family building. Of course, before the war, the family was my grandfather, Theophil Glotzer, and his son Walter, were so successful that the family really owned a conglomerate from 
dealing in textile machinery, sewing machines, etc., they branched out into office machinery. When he, when Walter managed to get to America, he went back into the same business. Excuse me. And he also got from the Swedish company, which for whom he had distributed adding machines and other office machinery in Poland before World War II, the right to distribute in North, Central, and South America, which was meaningless at the time because there was a war on and there was very little traffic of these machines from Sweden to the U.S. After World War II, he still had this right on paper, which meant that somebody else was doing the distribution, but he would get a dividend check and he had to go to the bank every month for a very, with a very substantial check from the Swedes. The Swedes also treated my grandfather very well. My grandparents survived the war. Grandmother, my mother's mother, died of natural causes, I think just before the war ended. Grandfather survived and went to Sweden where his former Swedish associates, I think, took care of him. But he died in Sweden. Okay, um, in 47, as I said, the Brits had this mandate from the League of Nations, which they violated. Why? Oil. Oil. The appeasing government of Neville Chamberlain in 1939 published a so-called white paper, again I say, in violation of the League of Nations mandate, by which they restricted immigration, as I said, of Jews to Palestine to 1,500 a month. And even though Churchill, as you all know probably, came to power in 1940, it was still important for the Brits to stay on good terms with the Arabs, the white paper stayed in force. Armed resistance against British rule began in 44. One of the more radical Jewish resistance groups was called the Irgun Sabai Leumi, headed by a chap who was named Menachem Begin a sergeant in the Polish army who deserted from my father's intelligence unit. <laughs> Another even more radical group was called by the British the Stern Gang after a leader who had been killed in a gunfight with the Brits and the Stern Gang, they were called the Lohamei Herut Israel, fighters for the freedom of Israel. Irgun Tsevai Leoni means national military organization, the Haganah which later became the Jewish army or the Israeli Defense Force. Haganah means defense and it came into being 20s or 30s as the unofficial army of the unofficial government of Jews in Palestine called the Jewish Agency. And uh, after the end of the war the survivors of the camps wanted to come to Palestine, most of them. 90% of Polish Jewry died in the concentration camps. But there were still thousands of Jews who had been hiding or survived somehow the camps. They wanted to come to Palestine. They couldn't. The Brits, the British Royal Navy patrolled the Mediterranean, intercepted the ships wouldn't let them land. Some did manage to land secretly. Captured the ships, took the Jews and put them in Cyprus. And then the Irgun Sevai Leumi and Lachamei Herut Israel started armed resistance against the British. 46, 47, 48, there were attacks on British, on Royal Army and the Palestine Police Force. The Palestine Police Force was partly manned by criminals because if a chap was facing a judge in England, 
the judge would often say, okay, you have a choice, five years in jail, or, or maybe two years in jail, or join the Palestine police force. So there were increasing attacks, there were increasing attacks on the Brits in Palestine. The United Nations had already, which had inherited the mantle of the League of Nations, concerned itself with the so-called Palestine question. And there were several possible plans which were drawn up so as to please, as to do an impossible task, to please both the Jews and the Arabs. Finally, I think possibly in 47, anyway, it was decided to divide Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs. The Jews the Jewish resistance groups fought on and at the same time had to repulse attacks by the Arabs. In 47 we left, my mother and I, no, I'm sorry, father and I went to the US. Mother went to Sweden, she wanted to visit the grave of her father who had died in Sweden. Dad and I boarded a liberty ship. Perhaps some of you know the name of Henry J. Kaiser, a great industrialist and builder. And during World War II, his shipyards produced two liberty ships a day to transport U.S. troops across the oceans. And I think it was estimated that one, it was sure that one of the ships would sink. And they, they, they built two of them a day. And, uh, Father and I arrived in New York, and I stayed, uh, Dad took a room someplace, and I stayed with an aunt and uncle in Forest Hills, uh, one of the boroughs of New York City. And uh, I still had a year to go of high school, and so my aunt took me to this Forest Hills High School, and I think since I guess you know refugees were still kind of interesting the principal wanted to interview me and I was told to wait in this huge auditorium which was easily four five six times the size of this room now American movies had kept coming to Palestine all throughout World War II and we would see these movies with you know Andy Hardy with Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland and they would let's put on a show and they would put on a show and we would we would be watching this pupils of this very very strict boys school St. George's you know how ridiculous how impossible and here I am sitting in the back of this auditorium waiting for the principal to interview me and on the stage are these kids doing La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. There was, there was a rehearsal for a show. Then you can imagine, you know, I was sitting there and wonder. I think maybe I want to put forward a mantra of mine, which you may care for or not. The school I went to, St. George's, was, as I've told you, very strict. The headmaster taught two courses himself, and the highest grade he would award would be 65 out of 100, because nobody could be better than that. The school was very tough, and I've said it many times to people, it was designed to break the spirit of the boys who went there, because when they graduated, they would run the empire. The map of the world until 19, the mid 40s, one quarter of the map was this color, red. The sun never set on the British Empire. And the boys who graduated from this school, whose spirit had, would go out to administer the empire and follow and obey any order that would come from London, any order. And some of them would become generals. 
or ministers of the crown. Those boys whose spirit was not broken didn't become ministers. They became prime ministers. And they did not become generals. They became field marshals. Because, and you'll be happy to hear, I'm about to end my talk. I think it was in McSorley's, a wonderful age-old bar in New York City, <coughs> with the walls covered with old photos and drawings and mottos, I read, let us thank God for the nails that pierce our sides because they put iron into the system. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. I don't know, I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, 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 do you have any questions? Well, questions? I am going to be carrying the microphone around if anyone would like to ask any questions. I guess I've stunned them into <laughs> the book. Do I see an arm over there? Hang on. You haven't received any formal Jewish education? None. No. None. Uh, <clears throat> it would have been advantageous for my parents to convert to Catholicism, the religion of Poland. They did not. They did not. No. No. And of course, in the school I went to, I guess you would call it the grade school, in Warsaw, there would be a religious class, and I might have been the only Jewish boy, and I would go outside and wait in the corridor. No. No. Thinking about your perspective, I'm sorry. Um, just re reviewing the perspective that you have um, and what you have been through. Um, what do you see uh, in terms of what happened in the United States and Israel? Do you have any perspective on that? What do you mean, what happened? I don't understand what you mean by what happened. Okay, I'm saying the life that that you led and the experiences that you have give you a unique perspective. And my question is, looking at the current state of affairs in the United States and Israel, what are your, what are your political views? Would you care to share them? Well, I think you probably know that Israel is called <clears throat> our aircraft carrier in the Mideast. It's the only country that we can depend on. Remember, it's practically next door to the Suez Canal. I don't have to tell you how important the Suez Canal is. I don't think that Jews are as influential as some people who don't care for Jews claim. But I think Jews are influential in this country. They're a minority, I forget how many, I mean, they're a small minority, but still, in both finance and particularly in show business, in the media, there, there are many Jews. And I think practically every administration we've had, either Republican or Democratic, or Democrat, has seen Israel as a very important ally, an ally that we can always depend on and who depends on us. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. When you became a... Well, hold on, hold on. When you became an adult... Could you speak a bit louder? When you became... Can you hear me? My hearing is not perfect. I am, but my hearing is not perfect. <laughs> Mine as well. Now, can you hear me? Yes. When you became an adult in New York and lived in New York, what was your vocation? What kind of occupation did you have? Okay. You want to know my work? What? Yes. Yeah. I went to Georgia. First, I went to New York University, and I didn't do too well. And I transferred to George Washington University in the fall of 1951. George Washington University had a weekly student newspaper called The Hatchet. You all know the legend about George Washington and the cherry tree. And 
I wandered into the offices and offered to write a c column. And I figured since the paper was called The Hatchet, I would call my column The Kraus, the Kraus Nest. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of my journalistic career, which ended when I wanted to write a column asking why there were black students from African countries at George Washington but no black students who were Americans. They wouldn't print it. And I was received by the president, Cloyd Heck Marvin, the president of the university. He had me to tea. And uh, he explained that the case, what was the case, the famous segregation case? Uh, yeah. Brown versus, Brown, versus, Brown, versus, Brown versus Board of Education. Brown, thank you, Brown versus Board of Education was before the Supreme Court. He himself was a member of the Cosmos Club, which was the club in what we know all the big people belonged to it. So I'm sure he was intimate with the Supreme Court justices. And he explained to me that uh, he understood my position, but it was the case, you know, the, the whole matter was before the Supreme Court, and then he preened himself on the fact that when the daughters of the American Revolution refused Marian Anderson the permission to sing in, was it Constitution Hall? Yeah. He welcomed her in a smaller hall, which belonged to the university. I didn't write for this paper anymore. I met my daughters mother, fell in love, married her, dropped out of school, worked as a construction worker briefly, and then I became a copy boy on the late Washington Evening Star. And I even carried either dispatches or photos from the Army McCarthy hearings. I was drafted, took basic training, <coughs> etc. And then I would, you see, in the army, there's a saying, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the army way. I can see heads nodding. And since I passed two, two army tests for European languages, Polish and French, the army sent me to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> and when I arrived at a, a Lad Air Force base, which was outside of Fairbanks, where there was stationed the 4th Infantry Regiment, the second oldest infantry regiment in the U.S. Army. I was being, you know, we were being processed, and the sergeant says to me, okay, Kraus, what did you do in civilian life? And I said, sergeant, I was at college, and what did you study? And I answered honestly, well, to tell you the truth, I slept through most of my classes, and I wrote for the school newspaper. Ah, you wrote for the school newspaper? So I was put... I mean, the best assignment was at the 4th Infantry Regiment Public Information Office. <laughs> I did not go out into the field. I worked in an office. I did not wear fatigues. I wore a dress uniform. And I wrote articles about army people, army activities. And uh, then after I left, I was discharged went back to Washington with my wife and at that time my daughter's brother David. I had some jobs and I was interviewed by the head of the Polish desk of the Voice of America and he told me, and he told me unfortunately and we were talking in Polish of course you have a foreign accent. <laughs> because of my German governess and the British school, I spoke English fluently, but with an accent, and he told me that the microphone would emphasize this. And then he said to me, I'm terribly sorry, I can't spend much more time with you because Budapest was burning. You see, this was at the, during the Soviet invasion, the suppression of, of the Hungarian the Hungarian Revolution. So I left, 
And I said to myself, every language I speak, I speak with a foreign accent. <laughs> and I went to see a medium grade movie. <laughs> However, I think through my father's connections, I was interviewed and accepted as, I was interviewed by an extraordinary person, Dr. Somebody, I forget his name, the State Department had a, and probably still does, something called Division of Language Services. And somebody during the Cold War, we're now in the later half of the 1950s, somebody, probably not a committee, came up with a brilliant idea, it was called the Leaders and Specialists Program, by which people, possibly from all countries, probably from the Soviet satellite countries, including Poland, important people were invited to the United States. They would tour the United States and be, they would be put in contact with their professional colleagues. Most of them, of course, did not speak English. So they needed a contract, contract escort officer slash interpreter. You're looking at it. So I had a very interesting job taking these people around the country, and I've probably seen more of the U.S. than many people born here. I even took around a film director, and we were invited and present at the Oscars. I came back from the first trip, which was a group of agricultural scientists, and through a friend, I dropped in at the offices you know, in those days, late 50s, there wasn't all the security stuff. You just walked in. I, I met a man through this friend of mine called John Jacobs, who was the editor of a magazine called America Illustrated, which was put out in Polish and Russian and sent to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union would send an ma equally beautiful magazine here in English. I want to tell you that the magazine we sent was very honest. There was one issue, I think in the 60s, devoted to the civil rights struggle. There were photos of the cops in Alabama beating the, demo, you know, the civil rights demonstrators. And I dropped in on John Jacobs. He was preparing the first issue of America Illustrated. And he said, hi Steve, well, where, where have you been? Uh, what you been up to? And I said, well, I just got back from this trip in ter you know, escorting this Polish delegation. She said, why don't you write an article for us about it? And I said, yeah, fine, sure. I'll be happy to do it, and, you know, and, and I thought that since this was owned by the United States Information Agency, I would have to, to get paid. I would have to fill out all sorts of forms that I happen to be allergic to filling out forms. <laughs> And John said, and I, so I said, you know, oh, yeah, fine, John, I'll do it. And I'll do this, you know, I'm happy to be an American citizen. I'll do it for nothing. And he said, this is 1957, he said, I don't think you know how much we pay. I said, no, how much do you pay? He said, we pay 10 cents a word. This is 1957. So it's like a dollar a word today. So I wrote many articles for them. <laughs> I wrote many articles. Uh, then I moved, I divorced, I got a, I divorced Hildes and David, uh, my late son's, Ben's mother, and I moved to New York City, and I did have all sorts of crappy part-time jobs, but I continued writing for the, for USIA. If I still have your attention, which is, marvelous. I want to tell you that after the war, Churchill went to his school, which was like St. George's, a good old-fashioned public school, and he said to the boys, remember the motto of the old school, never give up, never give up, never give up. I wrote an article about Consumers Union, Consumer Reports. Unlike the other articles I had written, it was rejected. I was told to rewrite it. I rewrote it, and the second version was rejected. 
And John Jacobs, the editor, said, well, you know, Steve, maybe, maybe we should just drop it. And I said, no, let me rewrite it. <laughs> and the third version was not only accepted, but was published both in the Polish and Russian versions, which made me feel, I mean, I was only paid once, but <laughs> very good. And I continued to have assignments, you know, uh, from the State Department, the language, you know, escorting. And, and I, in 67, I began writing for a so-called underground newspaper. It was called the East, uh, I lived on the, what we old timers called the Lower East Side, now it's called East Village. And the newspaper began publishing the day that Nixon was elected, called the East Village Other, which was a very radical paper, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, of course, opposition to the war in Vietnam. So I began writing for them. And then when that paper folded, many of us went to a anarchistic but sex, sex newspaper called Screw Magazine. Any other questions? <laughs> well, just let me say, I did write two books. I'm guilty of two books, one for the National Student Association called Work, Study, Travel Abroad, and the other one was called Variations in Love, which was kind of a guide to seduction. <laughs> I am now semi-retired, but I published my own newspaper, as Hildy said, New York Good News, which is nothing but genuine good news. Another question, Dad. Um, yeah, my question consists mainly of three parts. I'm sorry? Um, my question consists of um, three parts. I was afraid of that. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, mainly about like what we see now, conflict of uh, conflict, Palestine and Jerusalem. I'm and sorry, Israel. what I see now, what kind of conflict? Um, the conflict between Palestine and uh, Israel. I think both and sides are, I was about to say assholes. <laughs> I mean, this endless fighting, this endless bickering, this endless fruitless negotiations is ridiculous. Why the hell can't they come to terms? I look forward, if I may just add one more thing, way in the future to a Semitic Mediterranean confederation of all the Arab countries and Israel. Way in the future perhaps, but I hope it will come to pass. Second question. Um, yeah, that, that what our future would be the last part I thought about, but um, the first part would then be uh, as you lived um, there before the, the state of Israel was, was found? Yes. Found, um, can you describe how the living between, or how, how people lived there, Israel, uh, or Jews and, and Arabs? How was the, the living? Okay, at that time, as far as the Arabs were concerned, there was a small, well, very well to do, very small Husseinis, Nashashibis, wealthy class, very small, and not particularly large middle class, shopkeepers, etc. And I think most of the Arabs were quite poor, lived on the land, and as far as the Jews were concerned, Tel Aviv was already quite a bustling city, the Jewish part of Jerusalem also. There were, so I think many of the Jews were reasonably, you know, comfortable. Not maybe rich, but comfortable. And a great many lived on the communal settlements. There were various kinds of communal settlements. But I would think at that time, then, not now, a quite maybe a majority of the Jews in pre-Israel Palestine lived and worked in the communal settlements. How did they get along? Yeah, I think the question is how did the, at that time, how did the Jews and Arabs get along? The Arabs rose in armed conflict with the Jews. 1928, 22, 28, and then encouraged by Hitler and Mussolini in 36 or 37, there were armed conflicts between Arabs and you see, the leadership of the Arabs resented the Jews, not just because they, you know, the, 
the women and men wore shorts. They were bringing modernity to the country. And the elite, the small Arab elite, wanted to, didn't want the, most of the Arabs to get ideas, you know, to improve themselves. They didn't get along. Um, yeah, though, it would be then, but probably you just answered the question, if there would have been like a way to prevent the conflict we see today? Today? Yeah. How can we prevent it? Israel is independent. The Palestinians are semi-independent. How can we force them to come to terms? No, I think his question is, could it have been prevented then? Yeah. I don't think so. I really don't think so. Unfortunately, no. Are you from Israel or Germany? 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 Yeah. Okay, not really a question. I cannot hear you. <laughs> I just want to ask if you'll stay after a bit because your, uh, the years and the places where you were are very, are parallel with my family story. And so I just, I'm hoping you'll stay after so I can talk to you. I'm surprised so many of you, I mean, gratified and surprised that so many of you have stayed this long. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, of course I will, certainly. Any other questions? Yeah, since you were young, uh, I was young then, yes. <laughs> uh, during World War II, right. but you obviously knew a lot about what happened in the Holocaust. What kind of uh, attitude or reaction did you have when you found out what the Nazis were up to and how many uh, people that they eliminated, uh, both in Poland and, and other parts? I'd be happy to answer that, and I hope you don't mind if I answer it in, uh, the only way I can, which is in my own way. Polish people are often accused wholesale of anti-Semitism. No greater lie I know of. Already in 1942, the Polish underground sent an emissary through Hitler-occupied Europe to England to inform the West of the beginning of the Holocaust. Secondly, I believe that the Polish so-called the Polish underground, which was called the Home Army, Armia Krajowa, had a special, and I think the only underground movement in Nazi-occupied Europe, had a special department called the Zegota, whose sole aim was to help hide the Jews. Thirdly, in Yad Vashem, the Garden of the Righteous in Israel, there's a tree planted in the memory of a Gentile who saved a Jew or Jews. Percentage-wise, the largest number of trees is to the memory of Poles, who, I want to tell you, during World War II in Nazi-occupied Poland, if a Pole was found by the Gestapo to be hiding the Jew or Jews, the entire family was taken out of the building and executed on the spot, in the street, as an example of what, to the neighbors, of what happens to people who hide the Jews. I, I didn't, I, I have, I didn't, we didn't know about the Holocaust until after the war. We didn't, I, I didn't find out during the war what was going on. And I don't think many people did know. The West, the powers in the West did know and did very little. US and Britain are often accused of why didn't you bomb the railroads leading to the death camps? And I don't think there's a satisfactory answer. Another question over your dad. Yeah, I have uh, actually uh, Made me think of two I can't hear you. I'll speak a little louder. How's that? Good. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, one I was just reminded, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Jan Karski 
And uh, secondly, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the impact of the exile of the Sephardic Jews during the... Uh, Wait a minute, hold on. I heard about Jan Karski. What is your second question? The second question is about the exile of the Sephardic Jews during the Israeli War of Independence. And I think the estimate is that there were 800,000 uh, Sephardic Jews who were exiled from all of the Arab countries uh, because uh, Israel uh, declared its independence. I really, uh, Jan, Kars Jan Karski, I believe survived the war and I, although I think he may have died quite recently at a very advanced age in his 90s, he was honored both in this country and in Poland. I think his declining years, he was on the staff, on the faculty of one of the universities. You know, what? Who is he? I can't explain, see. Explain who he is. I said before, that, no, no. Jan Karski. Yes, I said before Jan Karski, didn't, I didn't mention him by name. Okay, Jan Karski was the emissary of the Polish underground in 42, who went to, through Nazi-occupied Europe to England to inform the West of the beginning of the Holocaust. I really, I, that's about as much, I never met him, I don't know much about him. He was not Jewish, he was a Pole. Polish Pole. Um, I really don't, I probably should know much more about the movement of Jews from the Arab countries. I don't. I think as far as the Jews of Abyssinia, that might have been foretold in the Old Testament. I know that Morocco had a uh, monarchy quite mm, either neutral or quite friendly to the Jews. I really don't, I, 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 I must confess complete ignorance. On, I'm sorry, I cannot answer your second question. Yes. This is a statement. Uh, my family is a Holocaust family from Poland. Um, my father's family lived in Drahovich. And when the Drahovich, Drahovich. And when the Germans came through, they came with loudspeakers and they said, for every Jew you bring out of hiding, we will give you a cup of sugar. The Poles in that area, in Drahovich, brought people they had lived with all their lives out of hiding and they were immediately shot on the spot. Finally, one of the uh, German officers stated, we're sorry, we have no more sugar. That's how many Jews were brought out of hiding by their Polish neighbors. And you know what? The Poles kept bringing them out. The so Poles what? what? The Poles kept bringing Jews out of hiding. So while there were many righteous Poles, there were very many anti-Semitic Poles. And this is in the 40s. Thank you. Uh, I am afraid I have to agree with you. But... Remember, Jesus had only 12 apostles, and yet his faith has conquered the planet. Uh, is it in the Talmud that there's a statement that there are always, is it 10 or 20 just men? Well, uh, men. Otherwise, the world would come to an end. Uh, I, I th I'm afraid that what you said is probably true, but I personally, it might be of interest to you, am a volunteer in New York City at the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous and uh, the foundation supports the hundreds, now there are about 800 left, of the righteous Gentiles and I, you're probably right. Most of the Poles were either neutral or there were some that, you know, did help the Nazis. But I, I honor the ones who at the risk of their lives and not just their lives, but of their whole family lives, help the Jews. Can I just interject something that in our family, Dad's parents were hidden in Warsaw during the war. Uh, no, grand another... no, no, no. Okay, well, let me then, correct. Let me finish that. And then other relatives were hidden with Christian families in Warsaw. Vanda was hidden, right? She was passing by the Christian. Please. So, here's your mic. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to point out that. Um, several members of our family were were saved by Christian Christians in Poland because at least one of them 
Vanda, dad's cousin, was hidden with a Catholic family and was um, passing as, as Christian. She was in the resistance. Not only that, but Janina, one of my mother's sister, ma married, I think I mentioned earlier on in my talk, married a Yugoslav. And uh, during the war, he hit them. And he's honored in Yad Vashem. There is a tree to his memory in the Garden of the Righteous in Israel. So maybe one more question, if there is one. Okay. You want I'm, I'm frankly surprised and gratified, I must say again, that so many of you have stayed, come and stayed. Uh, this is just so you... Louder, louder, please. This is uh, for your information, because you obviously are a very bright, curious... Could you come a, uh, <laughs> This is just for your information, if you want to know about the North African refugees, the 898,000 that were created in pogroms initiated by the Mufti, by the way, who was Hitler's commandant for Yugoslavia and uh, had a blueprint of Auschwitz was going to be his reward. He would build in Palestine if he would prevail. But and there's footage. If you go to, um, if you Google, I don't remember the name of the organization, Mufti Hitler, okay, you will come to an organization whom uh, Tom Lantos, may he rest in peace, a uh, congressman from Los Angeles, finally brought under the last administration to the Congress. And it details basically, it's a long story, that the Mufti wanted to stir the pot after the war. So purportedly, um, they were offered a deal that they would get a half of Palestine, and Mayer said, you'll take the North, and he said, I won't take anything. He wants war. So in any event, whatever is the lead-up, there were created 898,000 Jewish refugees when the state of Israel was declared all of northern Africa, Transjordan, uh, because they were told that the Jews took all of the land. And he was offered half. Um, and so communities that had gotten along for 500 years, 300, it was for grubs again, crystal knocked again. But this time, countries took them. And they went in front of the United States Congress last administration it didn't get very far, but if you want at least the history, the news reels the, 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 that you may decide for yourself, if you Google uh, Grand Mufti Hitler, um, it's the affidavits of the grandchildren, some who still survive, who experienced it, who brought it to the attention of the United States public, if you want to know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Krauss. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank um, you very much for coming and listening so patiently to my story. And we have further events planned in November. And if you want to take a flyer in the back in honor of um, remembering Crystal Knox. There are a number of events in November here at UCSD, not just academic, but also of music. Have a good evening.